Um, we have a, an interesting webinar for you today. I hope you can see it uh, coming through on your screens. Uh, how risky is your project and what are you doing about it? And just to say hello to you uh, in person, let me just uh, wave on the, on the screen. Um, this is me in my office where the Risk Doctor Partnership is based. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to communicate with you uh, in this way. But let's not distract uh, from the webinar by seeing me. Let's go back to the screen and to the slides. Um, this uh, idea of this presentation came from when I very first started doing risk management a very long time ago. It was, I think, 1984. Um, so that shows you how old I am, uh, which you might have just seen from my, my long white beard, which is currently growing, um, to give me that appearance of, of wisdom. Um, or maybe not. Um, when I first started doing risk management, um, it was very early and we had a very simple approach. And I was working with some projects and I produced a risk register. And then once we'd uh, produced the risk register, we categorized the risks uh, using the traffic light system that you may know. So red, yellow and green. Red risks are high priority. Yellow risks need to be monitored and green risks are OK to go, to carry on going the way we are and don't need any special attention. And I wrote a report uh, to the project sponsor. I said, we've done the risk assessment, here are the risks. Uh, there are something like, I think maybe 35 risks. Uh, five of them are red and 10 of them are uh, yellow and 20 of them are green. And I sent the report. And about a day later, uh, the sponsor came to see me. And he said, I got your report and I see the list of risks and I see the number of red, yellow and green risks. My question is this, how risky is this project? And I didn't really know how to answer him. How risky is my project? I have 35 risks and five of them are red and 10 of them are yellow. But does that tell you how risky the project is? And, and I realized very quickly that listing risks and categorizing them into red, yellow, and green, or classes one, two, and three, or high priority, low priority, doesn't answer the question for the overall project. And so I started to uh, see if I could understand this question a little bit better. And it's taken me quite a long time to answer these two key questions. The first question is, well, how risky is the project? And of course, that leads on to the second and equally important question, well, what am I going to do about it? Um, but the question is really, we have to start with the first question, I think. Um, how risky is the project? And there are two ways of answering the question. What we're used to doing as project managers and project team members is to produce a list of individual risks, which we list in the risk register and we describe in the risk report. And these are describing the risks in the project. But that isn't the answer that the project sponsor or the client or senior management want. They need a different level of answer. They want to know how risky is the project? What is the riskiness of the project? Not the individual risks in the project, but overall, how risky is the project? And we had no real way of answering that question, which is why I have all of these question marks here. Um, what does overall project risk mean? Well, as Maria Jose said, I have actually uh, worked with PMI and some of the other risk management institutes for quite a long time to try and specify or to, to clarify our understanding of risk and how it can be managed in projects and in programs and portfolios and in the wider business. And fortunately, in the um, uh, standards from PMI and other organizations, there are some very clear and helpful definitions. Um, if we just go back to the previous slide, you'll see that we have two levels of answer to the question, how risky is my project? One is to list the individual risks, which is what I used to do in 1984. And the other is to think about what overall project risk might be, how risky is the project overall? And these things are defined in our standards. So in the PMI practice standard for project risk management, and also in the latest edition of the PMBOK guide, the sixth edition, which came out in September 2017, there's a definition of individual risk 
An individual risk is an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has a positive or negative effect on a project's objectives. I'm sure you're familiar with that. In the UK, we have the Association for Project Management, the APM, and they also have a standard and a body of knowledge. And in the standard and body of knowledge in the UK Association for Project Management, we have a similar definition of individual risks. It's an uncertain event or set of circumstances that, should it occur, will have an effect on achievement of one or more project's objectives. So that's individual risk, and we understand those things. Those are the things that we identify and list in our risk register. But what about overall project risk? If you look in the latest edition of the PMBOK guide from PMI, you'll find a definition of overall project risk. And actually, it was in that practice standard for project risk management, which was published uh, nine years ago. And here's the definition. Overall project risk represents the effect of uncertainty on the project as a whole. It is more than the sum of individual risks on a project. So we want to know what is the effect of uncertainty on the whole project? That's overall project risk. And in the UK, our professional body has the same kind of definition. Overall risk is the exposure of stakeholders to the consequences of variation in outcome, the whole project outcome. And it arises from an accumulation of individual risks together with other sources of uncertainty. And what these, both these definitions are saying is that we can list the individual risks on our project, but you can't just add those things up to work out how risky the project is overall. Overall, we want to find out how uncertainty can affect the whole project and what the variation in possible outcomes of the project is. So this is quite different from individual uh, risks, which leads us to two levels of risk, individual risks and overall project risk, and then two levels of risk management. So individual risks are specific events or conditions that could affect our project objectives. There are opportunities as well as threats because those individual risks could affect us positively or negatively. And routine, regular project risk management focuses on this type of risk, on the individual risks, in order to enhance the prospects of a successful project outcome. So this is what we do normally in project risk management. We identify individual project risks and we manage them through the routine project risk management process in order to improve our chances of success. For overall project risk, it's something which applies to the whole project, includes all sources of project uncertainty, not just individual risks. And we use it when we're deciding on the strategy for the project, on the, uh, the way that we manage our programs and portfolios, and how we steer or control the project through project governance. And so we have two different levels of management of these risks. Individual risks are managed through the routine project risk management process. But overall project risk, how risky the whole project is, is managed in the way that we set up and control the whole project. What this means is that project managers have two responsibilities. You might ask whether project managers are interested in overall project risk or whether all we have to worry about is the individual risks. Well, of course, the project manager is responsible for identifying, analyzing and managing individual risks. Of course we are. We all know that. But what about overall project risk? Is this something for us as project managers to worry about and be concerned about? Well, I think it is because the project manager is accountable to the project sponsor for how risky the project is, for the overall risk exposure of the project. And so we have a responsibility for managing individual risks within the project, as well as an accountability for making sure that the overall project level of risk exposure is not excessive. So we need to manage both of these things. And the key question is, how? How are we going to do this? 
Uh, often it's done with the individual risks managed through the standard risk management process that we all know about. And we might call this explicit risk management. It's open, it's visible, it follows a process. You can see it done deliberately uh, in, in our projects. But uh, overall project risk is managed in a more hidden way, in a kind of second hand way during the scoping decisions which take part in our project initiation phase. So the decisions we make about the content of the project, the context of the project, the strategy of the project, these things in the scoping of the project are in response to our view of how risky the project is overall. So we have two different types of risk management, two levels of risk management. Implicit, which is kind of hidden, it's part of other activities, is addressing the structure of the project, the scope, the content, and the context. And as we set up the project during project initiation, then we're addressing the overall riskiness of the project in what's in the project, what's not in the project, what the objectives are, what the scope is, and so on. And once we've done that, in our project initiation phase, and we've defined the structure and scope of the project, then during project execution, we do explicit risk management through the risk management process, which looks at the individual risks which come up during the project. And clearly there is a relationship between these two, but often it's that we start with the scoping of the project in initiation, and then we just move to the risk management process and look at individual risks during execution. Well, does that mean then that overall project risk is not important during project execution? Are we not interested in how risky the project is overall as the project proceeds? Of course we are. And my uh, project uh, sponsor in 1984 was asking me every time we updated the risk assessment, well, how risky is the project now? And I had to have an answer. So we have to have a way of managing overall project risk during project execution. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about for the rest of this webinar. And there are the standard four steps uh, of what we need to think about with individual risks. We have to think about the same for overall project risk. Where does it come from? We need to identify its sources. How big is it? We need to quantify it. What are we going to do? We need to respond to it. And how do we tell people we need to report and monitor the level of overall project risk? So I'd like to take these four steps and give you some ideas about how you might identify and quantify overall project risk, which answers the question, how risky is my project? And then how you might respond and report overall project risk, which is deciding what we're going to do about it. So I hope that's okay with you. I hope that's what you're expecting. And I hope you find the rest of this interesting and useful. So let's start at the beginning with identifying sources of overall project risk. For, for this, we need to take a whole project perspective. We need to think about the project as a whole. The question is, how risky is the project as a whole? What is the effect of uncertainty on the whole project? What are the possible variations in outcome for the whole project? So we're not working through individual tasks and activities or, or work packages. We're thinking about the project as a whole. And overall project risk is a single thing. You, it's not like lots of individual risks. You might have 10 or 20 or 50 risks in your project. The project only has one level of overall project risk at any particular time. The project riskiness is one value. But that one thing, the overall project risk, comes from a range of different sources. So in the identification step of our process, we're not identifying overall project risk, we're identifying where it comes from. And there are a number of frameworks that we can use to find sources of overall project risk. And you might have heard of some of these. Perhaps the most famous is the PESEL framework. Now, these letters all stand for something. I'm going to tell you what they are, but in the paper, there's a paper in the um, documents section 
um, of the webinar, you can download a paper which uh, is linked to this presentation, and all of these abbreviations are listed in the paper. But PESEL is like a, a checklist. It's five, uh, six headings of things that we need to think about as potential sources of overall project risk. The first is political, then economic factors, social factors, technical factors, legal factors, and environmental factors. Political, economic, social, technical, legal, and environmental. And these six words are headings that we might consider when we're trying to identify the sources of overall project risk, things that make a project risky as a whole. PESEL has been around for a very long time. There are other versions of PESEL. There's one called PESLEAD, which is the same as PESEL, but you'll see we've added an I, which is for international aspects, and D, which is for demographic aspects, particularly useful if we're doing global or multicultural or dispersed projects. There's another one called STEEPLE, which is the same as PESEL, but with an extra E. The extra E is ethics. So we have social, technical, economic, environmental, political, legal, and ethical sources of risk. Then we have others in SPECT, which includes innovation and um, uh, communications. Then we've got SPECTRUM, which includes social, political, economic, competitive, technical and regulatory uncertainty, and market sources. These are all getting quite complicated, aren't they? Two more just to mention. TCOP, you might have come across, a technical, environmental, commercial, operational, political. And perhaps the most recent is VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Well, I don't expect you to remember all of those, and that's why they're in the paper. Um, but what we're saying is these things, these frameworks can be used as a prompt list, as reminders for when we come to brainstorm or do our SWOT analysis or we interview people, we can talk through the headings represented by each of these letters just to think about the various sources of overall project risk. What are the political issues, the environmental issues, the social, technical issues which result in our project being risky as a whole? So that makes it reasonably straightforward, simple, to identify sources of overall project risk if we use one of these frameworks. Once we've identified where overall project riskiness is coming from, the next question is to say, well, how big is it? How risky is the project? In normal management of individual project risks through the risk process, we start with a qualitative assessment and we look at probability and impact of each individual risk. Overall project risk also has two dimensions, which are like probability and impact, but not quite the same, because we're looking at the project as a whole. So the first dimension is the uncertainty dimension. It's the probability of the overall project succeeding or failing. So like an individual risk has a probability of occurring, Overall project risk has a probability of the project succeeding, which would be a, a percentage. The second dimension is the effect of uncertainty on the whole project, which is quantified as the range of potential variation in the project objectives. So if we have a budget objective of $100 million, could that be varying between 95 and 105? Or could it be varying between 80 and 200? That's the range of potential variation on our overall project budget. And clearly, if the variation is only plus or minus five, then it's not so risky, the overall project, as a variation between 80 and 200. So clearly, the effect of the size of that potential variation is a measure of the overall riskiness of the project. So that's how we might quantify um, overall project risk. In qualitative terms, that's quite difficult to do. What you would normally do with an, uh, an individual risk is to use a probability impact matrix with the red, yellow, green boxes 
to plot each individual risk on the box. But in fact, overall project risk only has one value. It only has, at any particular point in time, there is a, a single probability that the project succeeds. And there is a range of variation in the outcomes. And maybe in six months time, there'll be a different probability of success and a different range of potential variation. But for now, there's just one level of overall project risk. It's how risky the project is today. So we'd only have one thing to plot on the matrix, which isn't very useful. But we can use these two ideas, the probability of project success and the range of potential variation in a quantitative sense. Because both of those things, the effect of uncertainty on the project as a whole and the exposure of stakeholders to variation in outcome, have quantitative answers. If we ask the question, how likely is the project to succeed or fail? The answer is a number. It's 20% likely to succeed or it's 75% likely to succeed. We are quantifying the overall project risk probability dimension. And what is the potential range of variation in outcome? This is also a quantitative answer. There are numbers. It could be minus five plus five, or it could be minus 20 and plus 100. So these are numbers. And because they are numbers, we can use standard Monte Carlo simulation or quantitative risk analysis to answer these two key questions. How likely is the overall project to succeed and what is the potential range of variation? How wide could it be? How uncertain are the possible outcomes of the project? So we can use ordinary standard quantitative risk analysis with a Monte Carlo simulation to answer these. Now, I know that um, in multi Energia, you don't actually use Monte Carlo simulation very much. And maybe this is something that you might like to consider, or maybe on your big and complex projects, you might need some help from an outside consultancy or risk specialists in the business to answer the questions by running Monte Carlo simulations. But what I want to do in the next three or four slides is to explain as simply as I can how Monte Carlo simulation can answer these two questions. How can you know how likely the project is as a whole to succeed? And how can you know what the range of possible variations is in the project outcomes, say in the budget or in the delivery date or in the uh, performance parameters. So how would Monte Carlo simulation help you to do that? Let me show you a standard Monte Carlo simulation output. And this is a real result where we analyzed the possible cost of a project. And you'll see that there's a range here on the, on the bottom axis between two million and 2.8 million dollars. And in the vertical, we've got the percentage likelihood of the project costing one of these values. And here is an S curve, which shows you that there is no chance that the project will come out costing less than 2 million. So the probabilities of 2 million and below are zero. We can be certain that the project, the maximum the project will ever cost is 2.8 million there's a 100% probability that it will be at that value or less. And we can read off from this curve the percentage chance, the likelihood of finishing the project at any one of these cost values. So for example, if our target cost was 2.2 million, then we could read off from this curve by saying, well, here's 2.2 million. And here we can see that the chance of getting the project finished with 2.2 million in the cost is 23%, which isn't very good. <laughs> so it tells you that the chances of succeeding with the project uh, in terms of meeting this target are only 23%. That means that there's a 77% chance that we'll overspend. Well, how much could we overspend by? The full variation is between two and 2.8 million. But the chances of getting these very, very low costs and these very, very high costs are quite small. So usually we take from the fifth percentile, the 5% point, to the 95% point. And you'll see here the 95% point is 2.6. 
and the 5% point is 2.1. So the range of uncertainty between the 5 and 95% points is from 2.1 to 2.6. There's half a million dollars of possible variation in the cost of the project. Now you can begin to see with just those two things, we're answering the question, how risky is the project? There's only a 23% chance of, of finishing the project within the budget. And the range of uncertainty is half a million. It could be a little bit less than the target, but it could be quite a lot more. We can tell some other things from this particular S-curve. We can look at the average value. If all things were on average, we could expect the project to cost 2.35 million. That's the middle of this S-curve. And one other thing we could say, if we wanted to be really comfortable, we wanted a high chance of success, let's say an 85% chance of success. If we set the target at not 2.2, but 2.45, then we have a much higher chance of succeeding. But obviously it would cost us another quarter of a million pounds. So I hope you can see that from this one simple S-curve, we can begin to answer the two key questions about overall project risk. What are the chances of the project succeeding? And what is the range of possible outcomes, the variation in outcomes? So rather than looking at a picture, let me just put the answers in words. How risky is the project has two component questions. How likely are we to succeed? We've seen that the probability of meeting the cost target is only 23%. So that is how likely the project is to succeed. And on average, the, the um, analysis shows you that we can expect to be 0.15 million over budget, 2.35, which is 7% budget growth. We expect to be 7% overspent. That's a problem. And then we could ask the other question, what is the range of variation? And we know that the potential range is half a million which is 22% of our target. So there's quite a lot of, of, of possible variation in the project at this stage. That 22% is broken up into the possibility a 4% chance of being under and an 18% chance of being over. So we can see that, that the uncertainty dimension, uh, how likely the project is to succeed has an answer we're 20, 23% likely to succeed. And the impact dimension, the range of variation, also has an answer. In a 2.2 million budget, we could be vary, varying by half a million, which means that we could be 4% under, but we could be as much as 18% over. Now we're beginning to give our project sponsor some real numbers, some real quantitative answers to his question, how risky is the project? And the answer is quite risky. We have a small chance of succeeding and quite a lot of potential variation in the budget, in the cost outcome. Oh dear. Which leads us really to the next question. What are you going to do about it? I'm sure you know from the, the routine risk management process um, that we have risk management planning, risk identification, then risk analysis, and then risk response planning and implementation of those responses. So it's really important that we plan responses. Once we tell the project sponsor, there's only a 23% chance of coming in on budget, and we could be 18% over budget, then he's going to start wanting to make risk-based decisions on how do we manage the project? What do we do to make this risk exposure better, to give ourselves a higher chance of succeeding and to reduce the potential impact on the budget. So we don't just say, oh dear, the project's going to fail. We say, right, we know what the possible result of risk on the overall project is, what should we do to make it better? And like in ordinary individual project risks, uh, we have a number of different response options, different strategies that we could follow. We have the same kind of things that we could do for overall project risk. 
So, for example, for a big bad situation, a big bad individual risk, a threat, we might choose to try to avoid it. So that's avoiding for a negative risk. For the whole project, if we want to avoid lots of uncertainty, lots of bad uncertainty on the whole project, we could de-scope the project. This is a decision for the project sponsor, of course, not for the project manager. But we could avoid bad risk by taking out the high risk elements. Or actually, we could even cancel the project. We could say the risk exposure is so bad, you know, only a 23% chance of success. And we haven't got another half a million to spend if it goes really badly wrong. Maybe we really should just cancel the project. And that's the ultimate risk avoidance decision. Of course, things might be positive. We might show that there's a high chance of success and we're actually looking to be under budget, like opportunities for individual risks. If we have positive, helpful overall project risk, then we can take an exploit option, an exploit response strategy to increase the scope in order to create additional value. With individual risks, sometimes we find that we can't manage the risks ourselves and we have to ask other people for help. And we have the risk transfer, which is to deal with threats, or risk sharing, which is to deal with opportunities. And we can transfer or share elements of overall project risk in the same way, in the same way by involving others. So we could create a joint venture or a special purpose vehicle, or we could merge with another specialist company. Or we could subcontract elements of the project or maybe sell the whole project to somebody else. These are risk transfer and risk sharing options and they are affecting, are affecting the whole project. Again, these are not decisions for the project manager, they're decisions for the project sponsor. If we can't find somebody else to manage the risk for us, then we have to try to improve our risk exposure by reducing the negative impact or enhancing the positive impact, just like we would reduce the probability and impact of a threat or enhance the probability and impact of an individual opportunity. How can we make it the, the probability of success higher and reduce the potential variation? And lastly, we may just have to take an acceptance strategy with contingency in the overall project, contingency in the budget, contingency in the timeline, contingency in the resource requirement. So we have a full set of response options for overall project risk, just like we do for the response options for individual risks. And these decisions are decisions for a project sponsor to respond to the level of overall project risk, which we found from our earlier analysis. And then obviously, once we've taken the responses, we need to see what happens and that means we need to report the level of overall project risk to our stakeholders we need to tell them what is the current level of overall project risk where does it come from what are we planning to do to respond to that are things getting better or worse since the project started and once we've completed these responses where do we think the overall level the level of overall project risk will be next time we report so we need to tell them these things and that will be included in a risk a risk review report. The problem with this it sounds logical. Where are we? Where does it come from? What are we doing? Which way is it going? And, and where do we expect to be next time? We don't actually have any good ways of expressing that. There are no standard formats for expressing or reporting overall project risk. And so I'd like to suggest just a couple of things that we might include when we're reporting overall project risk to our key stakeholders. Some things you might like to put into a dashboard. And I'd like to introduce to you something that I call the project risk barometer. This is based on the first answer to the question, how risky is the project? What is our probability of success? And we could divide this barometer uh, which you would normally use to, you know, to measure temperature or pressure, something like this. This is going to measure the probability of success. If the probability of success is less than 50%, that means we're more likely to fail. So clearly we will be in a red zone of some kind of problem, a warning area. 
if our probability of success is, let's say, above 80%, 80, 90, 100%, that's quite good. We will be very happy with that. And so that might be our green zone where everything is great. And then in between those two, maybe from 50 to 80, here we're in a kind of a warning area where we need to be careful. And so if we define these three zones out of our potential probability of success, we could plot the progress of the project using the risk barometer. We could say, well, where were we at different review points, review one, two, three, four, milestones, and so on. And maybe we start off at the first review with a quite low, here's our 23% chance of success. But as we continue managing risk in the project, we plot the risk of, on the barometer as time goes by. And now we find that after seven review points and a couple of milestones, we've improved things quite a lot. And maybe there's a 75% chance of success. And we can draw a trend line through these points and see where we expect to be by the time the project ends. If we've made this kind of progress in managing overall project risk, we can expect to succeed. That's a good story. Of course, it will be worse if we just kept going along down here, and then you know there's something really wrong, and then we have some difficult decisions to make about the project. But hopefully, our risk management is good enough for us to have an upward going trend line. So that's one dimension. What is our probability of success? And we can plot that on a time against um, a probability uh, graph. If we want to look at the other dimension of overall project risk, our chance of success and the potential variation in outcomes, we can actually put bars around, variation bars around each of these points. So we're looking at the variability of our um, project outcomes, whether we're on track, over target, which would mean late and overspent, or under target. And you'll remember that the likelihood at this point, when we had a 23% chance of success, there was a big likelihood that we'd have a big overspend and a small likelihood that we could be okay. So here we have the, the, the error bars, the variation around what we expect. And you can plot those things with time as well and see where we are now. And you can create a trend line through these plots and see where we expect the project to end up. So here we have two things we could put on our dashboard. One is the probability of project success, and the other is the range of variation in the project. Are we likely to succeed or to fail? And how much variation could there be? Are we likely to be under target, on target, or over target? And these sorts of things might help us to report the status of our overall project to our stakeholders. Well, I hope that hasn't got too complex or complicated for you. Maybe reading the paper that is in the documents area would help. But let me just wrap up with a few final thoughts, and then I'm leaving five minutes or so for questions if you have any. So please be thinking about questions. There's no such thing as a bad question or a silly question. All questions are useful and they help us to understand the material better. So please do feel free to ask anything. And if you want to ask your question in Spanish, that's also fine, as Maria Jose will translate for me. So if these things are important, if overall project risk, knowing how risky is my project, is important, what do we need to do about this? Risk is really important not just individual risks, but the overall riskiness of the project. Both of these aspects are important and both of them need to be managed. Usually what we do is we only manage individual risks and we don't know how that relates to how risky the overall project is. But from the project sponsor's point of view, this is the important thing. How risky is my project and what can I do about it? Both levels of risk need to be managed. So what we need to do is to develop our best practice to cover both of these aspects. For most people, for most projects, for most organizations, they only think about individual risk. And so what we need to do is to develop techniques and practices to cover both. And the project management standards also need to help us to do that. And you'll have seen in this presentation that PMI in the practice standard and in the PMBOK guide 
are telling us how to manage both individual risks and overall project risk. And so is the UK risk management standard as well. It's really important that we deal equally with the risks in the project, the individual risks in the project, and the overall riskiness of the project. Both of these are important and both of them need to be managed. And hopefully some of the things I've shown you here will illustrate how this can be done fairly simply using standard techniques like quantitative risk analysis. So let me close while you're thinking of questions for me. I have three questions for you. How risky is your project? Do you know how to answer that question? Uh, would you say, well, I've got 10 red ones and 20 yellow ones and 30 green ones and that's how risky it is? Or can you answer the question overall, how risky is the project? And more important, what are you actually doing about controlling the overall riskiness of your project and making it more acceptable? And perhaps the most important question, are you thinking about overall project risk in your processes and in the way that you manage risk? If you're not, why not? Would it be possible for you to do that, to, to uh, improve or to strengthen your risk management approach, to think about these overall aspects as well as the individual risks? And what changes would you need to make in your processes, in your techniques, in your thinking, in your practice, to actually think about and include overall project risk in the way that you manage risk on your projects? It's really important that we're able to answer the question, how risky is your project? And it's equally important that we're able to do something about it to change the overall riskiness of the project. And I hope that this uh, webinar has given you some ideas about why it's important and more importantly, how you can do something about it. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you're all still listening. Um, if there are questions, then I'm ready to take them. I'm gonna hand back to Maria Jose to handle the questions. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Let's have some questions if there are any.